Hi everyone and welcome back to the Scuba Diving Tips YouTube channel. In this video today we're going to focus on the Petty Open Water Diver Manual Answers of Chapter Number 4. So let's dive right into it. Let's have a look at question number 1. Over here I have what we call a mesh bag. These bags are specifically designed to take under the water when scuba diving and you can easily fold them up, roll them up, put them into your beastly pocket and then whenever you encounter some trash on your dive then you can take it out and put the trash into this bag. Now, sometimes the dive site can be very polluted and there can be trash everywhere. It's very handy to have this with you on every dive so you can collect it but it's also very good if you sign up for these special Betty Aware cleanup dives and those dives specifically designed when you go with a group and you're just going to clean a specific dive site, reef, beach or anything that's related to it. It's absolutely, we should always hold these in our hands. Now the reason why is because when you keep collecting garbage in these bags, at one point it might get a little bit heavy or there might even be some sharp items in there. So if you have this clipped onto your BCD or anywhere else, you might now get entangled or if you want to let it go quickly, you can't. So we always recommend hold it in your hand and anytime you do have to let go in that unlikely event, you can just drop it and then you can always recover it later. Hey guys. Now, most people, when they have a fever and when they're really sick, they choose not to go scuba diving. But we all have a little bit of congestion here and there. Uh, you know, maybe a tiny little cold. And especially if you've already tried out a scuba dive with a, a very small cold and it was okay, then you're more likely to do it again. But this is really bad. And the reason why is because that congestion can block your sinuses or, or your, your air spaces in your body and now it becomes really hard to equalize or even at one point impossible. This can cause squeezes, this can cause reverse blocks or even worse. So for this reason we say even if you have the slightest cold just just drink a lot of water, stay at home and, uh, and rest until you feel better so you can continue your, uh, your next dive. Now, in the end, we're not doctors, I'm not a doctor, so to be really sure, we always recommend you to do a proper medical checkup with a physician, just to make sure that you're fully recovered to safely do your next dive. Remember the Petty slogan, the way the world learns to dive. Petty is a fantastic diving organization that created these programs that fits a lot of different kinds of people around the world, making scuba diving much more accessible to a wider public. However, there are some exceptions. And sadly, scuba diving is just not for everyone. You need to have a certain medical fitness to be able to go scuba diving. In the end, it's not just being weightless on the water and looking at a fish. We need to walk around with equipment on land. The dive equipment can be quite heavy. Uh, you need to get into the water and out of the water. If you are diving from a boat or you're in a swimming pool, you might use that ladder. And again, that equipment can be really heavy climbing up and down. Like the question says, we're wearing sometimes exposure suits and they can get very warm very quickly on land, especially in very hot climates. Then under the water, you might have uh, a current that you might have to uh, swim against. Again, we're always trying to avoid these currents, but sometimes they can just sneak up on you and you do need a certain fitness to be able to handle yourself in that situation. So any of these reasons or all of them combined, if you now already have uh, underlying health problems, sometimes you don't even know, maybe you have a weak heart, then this can cause serious issues. So if you know already that maybe you have an underlying health problem, especially related to the heart, then I highly recommend you don't don't just go scuba diving, but go and check yourself out with a proper doctor, a specialist, uh, or and a dive physician, just to make sure that you're fit enough to go scuba diving. Question number four, the all-time favorite of our Petty Open Water Diver students. 
Now you might go like, what? Come on, where's the fun in that? And I'm on holiday, I only have a few days, I, I wanna have a drink in the evening and then the next day scuba diving. And you know, in, in the end, I'm, I'm not your parents, you know, I'm not the government, I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor. And can I, can I say to you guys, you shouldn't drink or smoke at all? I mean, that's hard. Anything in life, when we do in moderation, uh, it can be okay. But we need to be so careful with scuba diving. And I know you're on holiday, I know you want to have a good time, but it can cause uh, big problems. For example, if you decide to drink alcohol before and, and also after the dive, it, it dehydrates you a lot. And then when we are scuba diving, we need to be extremely hydrated. Also remember that we're under pressure, that uh, we have nitrogen being absorbed and released constantly in our uh, bloodstream and tissues. And if you're very dehydrated, that can cause problems and, and maybe lead to decompression sickness as well down the road. And where it becomes a, a difficult thing for us is that we can't say, all right, you can drink, let's say two beers and you're fine. Or you can drink a maximum four of this and you're fine. Because we just don't know. It really depends on the person itself. It depends on how healthy you are, uh, how much you've slept, your tolerance to any alcohol. And, and you know, there's so many factors that we just don't know that we just recommend you just try to be honest not to drink and not to smoke at all at least a day before you go scuba diving and trust me you feel the difference like when you wanted the water you enjoyed so much more and then if you then uh, come back from the dive maybe wait a day and then uh, and then have some fun again if you want to how many times I had people canceling because they did went out the night before without me knowing it and they drunk a lot and they said, oh, I'm so hungover, I can't do this dive today, I'm so sorry and we have to cancel the course because now we have to fly out. Not only do you feel really sick because you're hungover, second, you missed out on some of the coolest experience and memories in your life, which is scuba diving, uh, just for something that you can do all the time and cost you a lot of money as well. So just, just, let it go for a little bit and just enjoy scuba diving. That's my recommendation. And if you really, really want to have that drink, hey, have a drink the night before, during dinner or something like that, but just one of them and then a good night of sleep and the next day, you're gonna have a great day. But whatever you do, make sure you never, ever, ever drink just before the dive in the morning or anything like that and have a good night of sleep before you go scuba diving. That's really, really important. Now, besides, feeling dehydrated or being dehydrated, alcohol can also cause this disorientation. And especially when you're intoxicated and you go scuba diving, this can cause really big problems. Like maybe you're not checking your air anymore, not often enough. You might not really care about checking, you know, your body and all these things. Uh, so you have to be sober to enjoy this sport. Okay, now for smoking then, smoking is just bad in general. And don't get me wrong, I mean, I don't want to be the guy saying, oh, smoking is bad, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm not all-knowing. I've, I've also made my mistakes in life, and a long time ago I smoked as well, but I'm very happy that I quit that. And especially as a diving instructor, it changed my life. It changed my career. It changed my enjoyment. We're under the water. We're breathing under the pressure. We need super strong, healthy lungs. So of course, when we smoke, that's not really good for your lungs. And and the moment I stopped smoking as well, I instantly saw that my air consumption improved. So if your air consumption is not so good uh, and you feel bad about that, then stop smoking. It's going to make a huge, huge difference. I know it's not always easy, but definitely try it. And if you don't smoke yet, then don't smoke, trust me. Now, besides getting a better air consumption and just generally feeling better, uh, if you smoke, it also really affects your, your circulatory system, blood is going around, uh, and, and, and all of this uh, can cause major issues when we go scuba diving. I know you might have done a few dives, maybe with some smoking, and you go, ah, oh, that was fine. I know, but trust me, it will catch up over time. So anyway, I know this is not what you want to hear, so let's move on to the next question. It's not just not taking medication, for example, for getting rid of your congestion. Because again, when you have a cold or a slight cold or any congestion, you shouldn't dive at all. But a lot of people are using medication regularly for different reasons. And uh, some of these medication you might be able to go scuba diving with, but some of them might not. 
And some of them can cause extra side effects or they can wear off under the water, which can cause problems with your health. So there's all these different reasons why some medication and scuba diving just don't mix well together. How do you know for sure? Go and check yourself up with a doctor or a dive physician. Bring the medication with you and they can let you know if that medication is okay to go scuba diving with or you might need to hold off or you might not be able to do the scuba dive at all. Better safe than sorrow and always check yourself up with a physician. Question number six. Now, I know you're excited to go scuba diving. I, I know you're on holiday. I know you really want to do this, but you are expecting a child or you don't know if you're expecting a child, but you might expect a child, so you might be pregnant. In all these cases, you shouldn't go scuba diving. And if you want to know really the reason why, well, so far, what I know is that they're not 100% sure yet how it affects um, uh, your pregnancy. And for that reason, they say, okay, just don't dive because you don't really want to gamble with this one, do you? Um, of course, this is something that you can still talk about with your dive physician or any physician, uh, but they will give you the same advice not to go scuba diving. Now, once the child has been born and you're fully recovered, then you definitely can go scuba diving again. So it's not like you can never scuba dive again. You just temporarily have to hold off to. Now, when can your child go scuba diving? Your child has to wait a little bit longer. Uh, it depends on what training organization you choose. But if you're going to go for petty, which I highly recommend, you have to wait until your child is eight years old to do some really cool kids scuba diving programs like Bubble Maker. And if they are 10 years old, then they can already begin with the Petty Open Water Diver course, the same course that you're doing right now or are about to do. Anyway, let's move to question number seven. So guys, if you are liking this video so far and if it's helping you a lot, then please don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to ring that notification bell so you get a little notification every time I'm uploading a new scuba diving training video. Um, especially the, the sharing part. Please copy and paste this link in your social media and then hopefully it can help some other people also. All right, let's get into question number seven. Okay, what is a scuba review? Well, first of all, the Petty Scuba Review is now called Petty Reactivate. Uh, so if you're a bit confused about why you can't maybe find some information online about the Petty Scuba Review, it's because you should search for Petty Reactivate. Now, what is it? It's basically a refresher course or refresher program from Petty that helps certified people to get back in the water again. So for example, let's say that you're completing your Petty Open Water Diver course. You have gotten your scuba diving certification. You might do one or two more fun dives on your holiday trip right now. And then you decide to go home. All right, back home, holidays finish. You go back to work. And then next year you're planning another holiday. You're going to a nice warm location and uh, woohoo, let's go scuba diving again. Yes, you do have that scuba diving certification uh, that allows you to go diving anywhere around the world. However, after a year of no diving, are you still fresh enough with all the skills in your mind to safely do another scuba dive? Maybe yes, maybe no. I wouldn't take that risk. If you haven't dived for a certain time and we're recommending it, let's say six months, then you should always do a scuba refresher, which is called scuba review, which is also called a petty reactivate before you do your next scuba dive. And trust me, it is an absolutely fantastic program. It's worth gold. It's super easy. It doesn't take long. It's not expensive at all. And at a next petty dive center, you're gonna get a petty dive master or petty diving instructor who will run you through some of the skills that you're a little bit rusty with. And then when you feel comfortable again, then they can take you on that next fun dive or maybe even a next course if you want to do another petty course. So it's absolutely fantastic. You might run into some dive centers that say, oh, we want you to do a scuba review or petty reactivate. 
all the time before another dive or course, even if you might have been diving last month. Well, it's their policy. So if you don't agree on that, you can always move to another dive center. But again, right? why not? Better safe than sorrow. Maybe you've already done thousands of dives and you haven't dived for seven months. Do you really have to do a refresher course right now? Well, it depends. So I always recommend go to your petty dive center, talk to the petty professionals and ask them for advice if you should do this petty reactivate, yes or no. I know that you are right now halfway through your petty open water diver course or you're about to do your petty open water dive course. So what is this petty enriched air nitrox diver? It sounds super cool, but is that a little bit far away from you guys? No, not at all. You should ask your instructor about this, but you can already get your petty enriched air diver certification together with your petty open water diver course. A lot of my students that I've taught love to do the petty open water dive course, then they stayed and joined the petty advanced course, and then some of them, they included the petty enriched air nitrox diver certification as well. So why is petty enriched air then so popular? It's because when we are diving normally on air, so in our, in our scuba cylinder, we have normal air, but it's not one gas. It's actually made out of multiple gases, a lot of multiple gases, but two of them are the biggest one, and that's oxygen and nitrogen. So to keep it easy, we say 21% of a scuba tank is oxygen and 79% is nitrogen. So when we go scuba diving, we're using the oxygen, we're metabolizing it, but the nitrogen gets absorbed into our tissues. And then later when we are making our ascent, it gets released from our tissues again, and it escapes from our body. The reason why we can't always dive indefinitely under the water and we have these NDLs, no decompression limits, I know they all sound very fancy, or maximum allowable times that we can scuba dive, is because of the nitrogen that we have in our tank, that we absorb in our body when we breathe from it, and the pressure that we're under, at one point we might risk decompression sickness. And that gives us that maximum dive time, and we have to go up before that time to make sure that we prevent decompression sickness. So when you're scuba diving on enriched air, we now lower the amount of nitrogen, which is awesome, and in return we get a bit more oxygen, and now we have less nitrogen, so we can extend our NDLs or maximum dive times at certain depths. So if you go to a place where there's a beautiful wreck at a certain depth, then you can maybe stay longer using the petty enriched air diver course or a nitrox tank on your back, then maybe with your air cylinder. So it is super, super popular for that reason. Now, why don't we put you on petty enriched air or nitrox straight away in your petty open water course from dive one, the reason why is because you need a little bit of special training and some extra knowledge. Because remember what I just said, we lower the amount of nitrogen, which can make us dive a bit longer at certain depths, that's awesome. But in return, we have to increase the oxygen a little bit. And that can maybe cause now some problems at specific depths under specific pressures, which can lead to oxygen toxicity. And oxygen toxicity is not something really good to get under the water. There's different uh, symptoms, but one of the main ones is that you start to twitch and sort of convulse under the water. And I know you might go like, oh, you know, you're turning into a break dancer or something like that. But it's, it's maybe fun. It's not fun at all because when you're twitching and shaking, then you cannot control your face muscles. You might drop your regulator. You might not be able to get it back in. And, uh, and yeah, this can end badly. So oxygen toxicity is something that we never, ever, ever want to get. Now, don't worry. I know you might go like, whoa, wait a second. I don't want to start shaking and, and twitching under the water. I, I don't like to do this petty enriched air. But again, if you stay well within the limits, then you uh, avoid getting oxygen toxicity. And that is why you shouldn't just, with no training, grab a nitrox tank and go scuba diving. You should always do this course and then your instructor will teach you where those limits are, how to stay away from it. And that means we can still now go maybe to a specific depth, stay there a little bit longer to enjoy more stuff, but not so long or we don't go so deep that we might risk oxygen toxicity. 
So if you want to learn more about this whole nitro stuff, which sounds super cool, then you should ask your instructor whenever you have some time. So to prevent getting dizzy or headaches or even worse, is to make sure that we always have good clean air in the scuba cylinders. How do you get contaminated air in your scuba cylinders? Is maybe when they fill it up next to a factory or a running car or the pipes just sucked in air, bad air, maybe there was a fire close by. Also the compressor can cause problems if it's not well maintained, if the filters are dirty and they haven't been uh, clean or renewed. So there's all these factors that can lead up to having bad air in your scuba cylinder. Now in the next question, question number 10, it explains how to prevent it. The deeper that we're diving, the more pressure that we are having on our bodies. Remember what I said before, is that when we're breathing from our scuba tank, we are getting around 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen into our body. We metabolize the oxygen, but we don't really metabolize the nitrogen. So under that pressure, the nitrogen is being dissolved in our tissues everywhere in our body. Now, the more and longer we stay under the water, the more nitrogen gets dissolved into our tissues every time we take a breath. Now, at a certain point, we might now risk decompression sickness. So it's important to ascend at the right time before we reach that limit uh, to prevent decompression sickness. Now, how do you know then when we have those maximum allowable times or NDLs and how to stay away from them so we don't get into trouble? Well, you can use different tables. So for example, we have this one here, which we call the RDP or Recreational Dive Planner. So it's a really handy table from Petty that can, where you can track your nitrogen exposure and know exactly when you should end your dive on time. Like for example, here on table number one, I know it's a bit small, you see these little black boxes in the bottom. This is your NDL or your maximum uh, allowable time that you can scuba dive on this dive. And then I recommend never go to the limit. Always stay a little bit away from that limit and then you make your ascent to stay within those limits. If you want to be a bit fancier um, or you don't like these uh, tables because they have too many numbers on them, then I recommend you to use this table. This is called the Petty ERDP ML. It's very cool. It's basically this table, but now sort of in a calculator version and you can now type in uh, your dive profile and it will tell you how long you can scuba dive before you risk uh, decompression sickness. What's really cool about this table compared to this table is, is that you can also calculate multi-level dives with this one, so you can even do more. So ask your instructor about these tables if you'd like to learn more about it or if you want to use them. Also, there are some videos on the channel that explains these tables a bit better. Then again, though, it is 2022 and most of us are diving with these cool uh, dive computers. So this is an actual dive computer, not a fancy watch which is awesome. So I do like to use it as a watch as well. But when I go under the water, it goes into dive mode and it tells me everything in one go. Uh, these guys are very cool, but this is, is I think, uh, a lot better and, it, uh, and it's a, a very accurate uh, and it just makes me feel so much more comfortable under the water. This is not the only dive computer out there. If you like to have, for example, a bit of a bigger one, then you can, uh, you can maybe go for this one. As you can see, you can see the details much more easier. Maybe you're diving with a thick wetsuit or maybe a dry suit. And um, a lot of those divers, they prefer these big dive computers. Or if you just want to go even more stylish and more newer, then this is one of the latest dive computer that came out. So again, there's all these different versions out there. Some dive computers you can even put on your console next to your SPG, do your pressure gauge, so you can check your air and you can instantly see all the details on your computer as well. Dive computers tell you your depth, the temperature of the water, uh, your NDL, how long you can still dive at, at any certain level that you are. It tracks your nitrogen exposure throughout your surface interval. 
so you exactly know on the next dive what you can do too. It tells you how fast you're going up to the surface, when you can fly again, and the list goes on and on and on and on. So if you really enjoy scuba diving, I highly recommend you to get yourself a, a dive computer to not only make your scuba dives more safer, but to just feel much more comfortable having all your important details right there in front of you. If you're not really sure which dive computer to choose, then have a look down in the description as I put some links of different kind of dive computers that I recommend um, and uh, go and have a check that out. So if you purchase your first diving computer, at least you know that you have a good one. So what is this decompression sickness? Now, like I just explained in the previous questions, when we're going on the water, we're under pressure. We're breathing air from our scuba tank. We metabolize the oxygen, but we don't really metabolize the nitrogen. So where does that go? Well, every time we take a breath, it goes into our system and it gets absorbed in our tissues. That is okay. It's not a problem at all. But but when we're diving too long, we keep adding and adding and adding and adding nitrogen. And at some point, this can cause issues. So if we then decide to make an ascent, now this nitrogen will come out of our tissues. And if we absorb too much, this can cause problems and lead to decompression sickness, which is basically then a nitrogen forming bubbles, getting stuck at different locations in our body can be in our joints, let's say for example here in the elbow, so it's hard to move it. Just under the skin, this can cause this tingling feeling that you might have little needles stepping you wherever it is. You might get a little rash or a red spot uh, at the area where it's happening. All of this is definitely not good, but it can also become more serious where maybe those bubbles are now blocking, for example, blood towards your heart or even worse to your brain at that point. And, and that can lead to some very, very serious conditions. So that's why we wanna avoid decompression sickness by not diving on the limit or longer than the limit, but always make our ascent uh, a little bit before that limit. And again, to know that limit, yeah, it depends on how deep you're going. So it's really important to use these dive tables to track how long you can stay and then to make a safe ascent. Remember, dive computers, they are very, very accurate, very handy, and I highly recommend you to always scuba dive a dive computer to prevent this from happening. Now, another reason of maybe getting decompression sickness is when we're going up too fast. So remember the maximum ascent rate is 18 meters per minute. But how do you know what 18 meters per minute is under the water and how fast you are going? Again, that's where these dive computers become super, super, super handy. And on these dive computers, you have, depending on the brand on the right or left side, what we call an ascent rate meter. And it gives us these little bars that tells us how fast we're going up. This is absolutely fantastic. And I think it's one of the best things that a dive computer has. And actually a lot of dive computer models are much more conservative than the recommendation on the tables, which means they are set on nine meters per minute or 10 meters per minute. And if you reach the max of that, it starts beeping, beep, 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 letting you know that you're going too fast and you should slow down. If you really push that limit, it now tells you even to stop completely for a specific amount of time. So it's really cool. So when we're making our ascent, you just leave some air out of your BCD, then start swimming. And then you can just look at your computer ascent rate while you're swimming, but also look up, but look at your computer. And then sometimes adjust a bit of buoyancy again. So maybe let some air out of your BCD if needed. And that's basically how we're making our ascent. Or if you're using a line, you're just pulling yourself up. Do remember though to once in a while look up so you don't hit anything. So really, really handy. And staying too long or going up too fast can cause decompression sickness. If you wonder why this is happening when you're going up too fast. So picture, for example, when you're having a soda drink bottle, let's say Coca-Cola bottle or something like that, and you shake that or we drop it. We all know that when we open it instantly, what's happening, right? You see all these bubbles forming and it comes out. And that's because you, you, you instantly open from a high pressure inside the bottle to a low pressure, which is one bar in the air. 
and that, that huge pressure change just gonna go like that. And, and when we are under the water, we're going up too fast, you also have a, a high pressure to low pressure too quick, and now we also might have bubble forming in our body. That's why we should always go up slowly on any ascent that we do while scuba diving. Let's get into the next question, number 13. So again, decompression sickness is when we maybe stay too long or went up too fast, and then the nitrogen that is releasing from our tissues starts to form bubbles, which get stuck in different areas and that can cause problems. So there's different signs and symptoms. In this particular question, it says numbness. So maybe not feeling a few of your fingers or areas like your elbow or anywhere else in your body, tingling like little needles are stabbing you or like a uh, feeling like, you know have you ever had a sleepy hand or arm you know when you're laid on it it feels like that um, maybe a red rash or feeling extremely weak and tired and fatigued is a, is a very clear sign and symptom that you might get decompression sickness after a dive there's also worse versions where the bubble is now blocking uh, blood flow to certain areas like the heart or your, or your brains, and this can cause even bigger problems. You can have pain, you can feel dizzy and even unconscious. So I know it sounds all very, very scary. However, if you follow all the rules that you're learning right now in your petty open water dive course, you stay well away from your limit, then it is very unlikely you will get decompression sickness. But there's always a chance. So for this reason, you need to learn the signs and symptoms so you can recognize it on time so you can get medical attention. And that is the next step as well. If you have decompression sickness or you are in doubt, always seek medical attention from a physician uh, or even better, a dive physician if you can. And they can do a checkup with you and then take it to the next step. So like I said, you can get decompression sickness by staying too long uh, at a certain depth or by ascending too fast. However, there are secondary factors that might increase the risk for decompression sickness, like for example, age. So the older we are, the higher the chances we might get decompression sickness in certain conditions because of age. So usually the older we are, the, the weaker we get, and that means we have a higher risk of decompression sickness. So always do a medical checkup with your dive physician before you go on your next scuba dive. Second one, if you get cold. So remember as well what we explained in the previous Petty Open Water Manual Diver chapters is that when we are under the water, we can get much more colder quicker than when we are on land. So when you are not wearing the, the right exposure suits, you might get too cold and this can increase the risk of decompression sickness also. Next one, any injuries you might have. Any injuries you might have, like for example, scar tissue, uh, maybe you were, I don't know, in an accident before you went scuba diving, maybe you broken a bone and it hasn't healed properly yet, all of that can increase the risk of decompression sickness. And then last in this question, poor fitness and high body fat. So again, we don't have to be athletic swimmers to go scuba diving, you, but you should be healthy and you should have a certain fitness. If in any of these cases, you just don't know if you are fit enough to go scuba diving, then download the Petty Medical Form and take that with you to your physician and do a proper checkup before your next scuba dive. If you don't know where to download this Petty Medical Form, in the description below, I added a link for you to learn a little bit more about the Petty Medical Statement and how to download this form. Okay, so why is this important? Well, first of all, we are recreational divers. So when you get your Petty Open Water Diver certification, you are a recreational diver. 
or if you continue, which I recommend, to do your Betty Advanced course and you get that certification, now you're still a recreational diver. Even if you do your deep specialty course, you're still a recreational diver. So up to a depth of 40 meters, we are recreational divers. And that means that we can always make a direct ascent to the surface whenever we want to. Of course, not too fast. And we always recommend you to do a safety stop at five meters for three minutes in the end of that dive. But you don't have to do a decompression stop to off-gas nitrogen before we can safely go up to the next level. Now, this is what we call decompression diving. And this is what you will learn and do when you become a technical diver. It's not a lot harder, but it is a little bit more complicated than rec recreational diving. So a lot of people, they just enjoy recreational diving, but some people, they just love to go a bit deeper. And they love to visit these places where no one has ever been before. So if you feel that you're one of those adventurers, then ask your instructor about more information about technical diving and how you can sign up for those courses. Also, if you want to learn a little bit more about this whole difference between no stop diving and decompression diving on your petty rdp table on the back you find some information and here it states that the recreational dive planner is designed specifically for planning recreational no decompression dives on air only do not attempt to use it for planning decompression dives so over here again when i go to the first table then if you stay within well if you stay within these black boxes or no decompression limits, at any time here, you can just make an ascent to the surface, not too fast again, while making that safety stop, but you don't have to do these forced decompression stop to off gas, as that is something you learn in technical diving. So mentioned before, the deeper that we dive, the more pressure we have on us, and it also means the faster we're absorbing nitrogen. So the shorter we can dive. So there's not a big difference between a depth of 12 and 10 meter, but there is still a difference, which means our NDL gets a little bit shorter at 12 meters than it is at 10 meters. And you can see that very clearly on the PEDI RDP table. So over here, again, dive number one, if I look at 10 meters at the top and I go all the way down to the bottom, to the black box, it says here my NDL or no decompression limit is 219 minutes. If I now look at 12 meters, this is right next to it, I go all the way down. Now it says I can only stay for 147 minutes. So you can see there's definitely a difference there. If you might be wondering, yeah, well, what if I'm not planning my dives with these tables and I like to use dive computers, then in the middle of your dive computer screen, it will show you the maximum allowable time or your NDL. So when you're diving to 12 meters, which you can find at the top, then your NDL will be a specific number. If you now decide to dive to 10 meters, you will see that your NDL will be bigger and you have more time to stay under the water. We just explained it on a previous question very, very well, where I said that on dive computers, depending on the brand, right or left, you have these ascent rate meters and they tell us exactly how fast we're going up. When we reach that limit, it starts beeping, beep, 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 reminding you to slow down or stop for some time before you continue your ascent. If you ignore that and you keep going up, now you're risking decompression sickness because we might go up too fast. So again, dive computers are awesome because they really help us to know exactly how fast we're going and to prevent us from getting decompression sickness. What we mean with a repetitive dive is the second dive or the third dive or the fourth dive, so not the first dive. So for example, on your first dive, you went to, let's say 12 meters, where your NDL was 147 minutes. If you now do your second dive, when you're going to the exact same depth of 12 meters, you're gonna find out that your NDL suddenly is shorter. Now the reason why is because when we finish our first dive, so we ascend all the way to the surface, we still have nitrogen in our body. And while we're on the surface, we're breathing that out over time. 
Now let's say you go back into the water an hour later to do your second dive, then we still have nitrogen in our system, however it's going to be a lot less than when we came up from the surface because we breathed it out on our surface interval. Now this little bit of nitrogen that we still have left, when we go on our second dive, we absorb new nitrogen and we kind of have to add that together with the nitrogen we still had in our body from the previous dive. So then when we come up, we now know how much nitrogen we have for the next dive. But because we still have some nitrogen left from our first dive, our maximum allowable time or NDLs are now going to be a little bit shorter. If you're liking it, don't forget to do all of this that is on my t-shirt. Alright, so when we're going scuba diving with our buddy, then each of us should have a dive computer on us. Now, under the water, remember that we might have different conditions, like for example, we might have some currents or it might be a little bit cold. And also, depending on the brand, if your body dives with a different brand dive computer, so the way that your body's dive computer calculates might be slightly different than your dive computer as you're using a different brand. So even if you are using the same brand dive computer, remember that we're all a little bit different as well. So when we're scuba diving, we have these two factors that tell us when to turn us around. First of all, how much nitrogen we are absorbing and what is our NDL. And second is how much air we have left in our scuba tank uh, to make sure that when we turn and we go back that we still have enough air left to reach the entry point or the boat. So whichever one comes first is when we're turning around. On some dives, maybe because there's a bit of a current, you're gonna find out that you're running lower on air much quicker than for example your NDL, so you're gonna turn around. On another dive, you're gonna find out that you have plenty of air and it's all good, but you are at a specific depth that your NDL now might say, all right, it's time for you to turn around. So it really depends how deep we're diving, how, how the conditions are with currents, how much you're breathing, your body, how much he's breathing. So it really depends. Sometimes it's going to be your NDL and sometimes it's going to be your air consumption that tells you when to turn a dive. So when you dive with another person, they might have a different band dive computer, which means sometimes that different dive computer can be a little bit more conservative. Maybe your dive buddy has already done a dive before and he has much lower NDLs or other data. Whatever you choose, always choose the most conservative dive computer from the two to know what to do on the dive to stay safe. So this is being repeated all the time. Your computer will give you your maximum NDL. That doesn't mean you should dive to exactly that time. Uh, always stay a little bit away from that, at least five minutes, but sometimes even more than that. If you have an ascent rate meter telling you how fast you're going, you shouldn't let it go all the way to the max and then keep that speed, you should stay away from that. And to be honest, I always like to make it a mission to have my ascent rate meter go up as slow as possible. Sometimes only even one little bar when I'm making my ascent. So stay well within the limits. So when you dive with another person, they might have a different band dive computer, which means sometimes that different dive computer can be a little bit more conservative. Maybe your dive buddy has already done a dive before and he has much lower NDLs or other data. Whatever you choose, always choose the most conservative dive computer from the two to know what to do on the dive to stay safe. You should always go down in the beginning to the deepest point and then just make an ascent and go a bit shallower and a bit shallower and a bit shallower, kind of like a multi-level dive profile back up to the surface. It's being tested that you lower the risk of decompression sickness when you always go to the deepest point first and then gradually going shallower until the end of the dive. And then last one, so again, always go slow. Your dive computer will tell you 
exactly how fast you're going. So that's fantastic. And also remember that we should do this safety stuff at five meters for three minutes. Now, how do you know where that is? Yeah, you can use a depth gauge meter. You can use a dive watch, but a dive computer is much more easier because between, depending on the brand, three and six meters, it will go automatically into safety stop mode, which means that the NDL number usually disappears and then it gets replaced by a three and that counts down to a two, two or one. And then you get these little lines to tell you it's safe to go up to the surface, which is awesome. Now do try to stay at around five meters at all times. If you can hold on to a, an ascent line, that's even better. And if not, you just have to enjoy your buoyancy. And again, you're gonna be practicing this a lot throughout your petty open water dive, of course. You should always follow your dive computer's manufacturer recommendations. This is extremely important. And how do you know them? Well, there's a little manual that comes with your dive computer, read it or download it on a PDF from their website. A lot of people that I found out, they just don't wanna read these manuals and they just wanna go and dive and play with it. And even up to their dive master training course, a lot of them, they still don't really know a lot of functions of their dive computer. And of course, this can be dangerous. So do make sure you check that manual before you go scuba diving with your dive computer. very unlikely that your diving computer fails fantastically built however it can happen in my entire career and i have done over 7000 dives i had my dive computer malfunctioning once on me so it is possible but very very rare how do you know it's malfunctioning well it can be different things like it can appear and disappear um, it could be flashing uh, it could go on and off uh, you'd never really know what happens but when it happens you do know and in this case you don't know how long you've been diving with a bad dive computer so i wouldn't risk it anymore don't continue diving just cancel the dive go up nice and slowly do do your safety stop if your air permits it and then go up to the surface now when you reach the surface then don't go scuba diving anymore monitor yourself for decompression sickness if you're not 100 percent sure check yourself up with a physician and always contact your diving computer surface station and explain to them what happened so they can have a look at your computer fix it or you might need to replace your computer Last question, number 23 of this Petty Open Water Diver Manual Answers, chapter number four. So why do we love scuba diving so much? Is because when we're going scuba diving, we can visit these beautiful reefs with an incredible diversity of aquatic life. Fish everywhere, crabs, stingrays, sharks, beautiful, colorful, coral everywhere, and it's amazing. And we need to make sure that we take care of it, not only for ourselves, but also for a future generation to enjoy it. These reefs have been here for thousands of years and they're extremely delicate. If you touch it slightly, you can damage it, you can break it, you can kill it, you can affect a lot of uh, organisms around it. If there's trash on it, uh, it gets even worse. So whenever we go scuba diving, always make sure that you have this, uh, this mesh bag with you so you can collect some trash. And that means you are a much more environmentally friendly scuba diver. Now there's more to it. A lot of animal species are on the brink of extinction, especially sharks and rays are in trouble. You also have global warming, uh, which causes coral to bleach, and the list goes on and on and on and on. A lot of people in the world, they might not care so much about the underwater world, it's because they just can't see it. But we scuba divers, we are there all the time. So we are the best ambassadors to help to protect this beautiful environment. Now, if you're not really sure where to start, uh, besides maybe picking up a bit of trash everywhere, then have a look in the description where you can find a link to some more information about Petty Aware. And Petty Aware does so many different things to help to protect our oceans and all the life that's in it. And you can be part of that in so many different ways, from super easy things to much more harder intensive things. There is something to do for anyone 
And in the end, if you really don't have any time or any energy to help in these conservation programs, then maybe at least you can leave a deposit because with that money, other people and Petty Aware can do really, really good things. So again, don't forget to check that link and to spread this information and awareness to others. Even the easiest thing is to maybe just copy and paste that link and put it on your social media and it might now inspire or influence other people to help out.